Hello, welcome to online worship at Christ Lutheran Church, Visalia, California. I am Pastor Brian Mallison. I can't tell you how excited I am that you were able to join us today wherever you are. We continue our May worship series. It's entitled Bold Faith. And may you have a bold faith, a, a bold purpose, a bold speech, and today we reflect upon having a bold prayer, especially in these challenging times. God be with us. Welcome. We gather for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, we're invited to boldly enter into the throne room of God and to let God know of our greatest needs. Today, we boldly pray. Would you join with me? Holy God, lead us to you. Help us to find our way to your presence. Guide us that we might discover your peace and love, even when fear seems so real. Allow us the calmness of these moments of worship to remember that we are yours 
and nothing can separate us from your love, not even a virus. Help us to reflect your light in dark times and make us to be people of peace, equipped with words and actions to make a difference in our community and on our world. This we boldly ask in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The word kairos is a Greek word. It's a way to define time. The other way to define time in the Greek language is the word chronos. And from chronos, we have chronological order, the way in which we tell sequential time. But kairos is different. Kairos marks holy time, a time when God shows up and does God's work in our world, in our lives. And each week, we love to lift up kairos stories of folks within our church who have experienced God. I want to thank those who have so shared those moments and send out an invitation to others who wish to be a part of our Cairo stories, simply email me and let me know of your interest. And now, our first Kairos moment of the day. I'm Kathy. And I'm Stan Mies. He's been my rock through all of this. I work in a nursing home. Um, we're going through the COVID issues right now. We don't have any COVID patients, but one of the nursing homes here in town that got hit the hardest um, is one where I have a lot of friends and I've worked there before, so I really know. Um, it's changed us forever. I, I come home and, and my family has to do with me being so exhausted. I just can't hardly function. Um, it's really lonely for a residence, and that really gets to me sometimes. Um, it just drives me nuts when people devalue our elderly because um, it could be any one of them someday, and it could be any of their relatives right now. Um, they not only can see their families, but they also have to look maybe through a window or through a um, a um, hmm? FaceTime. FaceTime, yeah, a tablet or something where that technology isn't, a, isn't familiar to them and, and it's also hard for them to see or hear the people that they, they love. They can't really connect it being with that person. And not only that, but they see us in our masks every day and it's, it gets to all of us. It gets to them, it gets to us. It's um, lonely. Um, there's times I just want to say, forget the paycheck. I want to just go home, eat chocolate, forget it. Um, but I won't. Um, Pastor Brian talked about um, speaking boldly last week. And speaking boldly isn't easy for me because my voice doesn't go very well. But um, getting up and going to work right now is one of the boldest things I can do. And it's really... Um, taught me a lot about faith, about um, s stepping out in faith to do for others, to take care of other people and not put yourself first. That's. I would just say I, I honor my wife. I admire her uh, for what she does. Uh, I'm amazed at all the people out there like Kathy who are out there doing what they can to help the people and take care of the people and um, provide and support them. So I just, I'm kind of a cheerleader right now yeah. for, for my wife and others who, who take that. Well, and I have to add my job is as an activity director. So my job is really to help alleviate loneliness and depression, which is a really heavy thing to have. I don't have the the job of being a nurse or a CNA who have direct contact. And I don't know which is hardest. I think they have the harder job because they're putting in longer hours. They're on their feet a lot more than I am. I really want to thank them. And I also want to thank Westgate where I work because we are prepared and I'm really grateful for that, for the caring and love that our staff shows. But um, our nurses, our CNAs, our housekeepers, they get their hands a lot dirtier than I do. 
Um, but just the emotional part for me is really, really a hard one because that's where it really counts for these residents. So, I would like to say part of our Kairos moments, <laughs> I really want this on here because I really am thankful to Pastor Brian and Havila and her family and all the people behind the scenes that, like yourself who put this together. and. Um, it's, it's a great encouragement to in our faith and our walk with God. And so just can't say thank you enough for all that you guys do. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here.
Good morning. This morning's reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, 1 through 10. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and then and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Here ends the reading. Last week, my family took a drive for the first time since this quarantine thing started. We just wanted to get out, not to be enclosed within walls for a time. We knew Sequoia Park was closed and there was nowhere to stop, but we decided to head that way anyway. We drove through Three Rivers up to the park entrance, turned around and came home. Yes, we were still enclosed in the car, but at least we were moving and the scenery, well, it just let us breathe for a while, you know? There is something about free and open space. In this valley, we're spoiled by it, aren't we? Acres of fields or orchards, areas that if you have a horse or a mountain bike or even a good pair of hiking boots that you feel you can just go on forever. The author Lois Malcolm describes prayer as exactly this a free and open space that God has given us where we can explore who we are and who God is. God knows that we can't be spiritually cooped up either. We need freedom. And in, in prayer, God gives us space to move and breathe fields and foothills. That means something special at a time when we don't have the norm of physical freedom. And the invitation to explore who we are can be more poignant, too, and sometimes more challenging. This story in Acts that was read for us a few moments ago, well, I have to confess, it really challenges me. Studying it and digging into it has revealed some things about my own prayer life that, well, disappoint me in my own lack of boldness. It's complicated. The Apostle Paul's advice to pray without ceasing, well, that's easy for me. And I often feel that I have a constant conversation with God. But at times when it's really important, I find that I don't really pray for the big stuff. Even when Lim was in emergency gallbladder surgery earlier this year and it was taking hours longer than it should have, I found that I couldn't even reach out and ask others to pray. I was enveloped in silence. My kids prayed. I didn't. How weird is that? What is, was it because I've seen too many important prayers answered with no? Was it because I was chicken, afraid that if God didn't do what I wanted, that my faith would be shaken? I don't know. It's not that I felt God was absent. In fact, in that waiting room, Empty on a Sunday night, aside from me and my children, the presence of God was palpable to me. I just had nothing to say. And maybe you've had moments like that, too. In me, I think this maybe has been a gradual thing. There have been seasons in my life where I, I prayed earnestly and deeply for miracles like the one in the book of Acts. But I can't recall any time when there was a positive result to those prayers. I have seen powerful prayers answered. In fact, I have even experienced some tangible healing when others have prayed big prayers for me. 
But I confess I haven't seen this in my own prayer life. And that's okay. Even though considering this was hard for me, I'm starting to think that the results are not the important part of bold prayer. What's important in that free and open space of prayer is what we discover about ourselves and how we are transformed by the act of prayer. The big challenge when we read that Peter says to the man that he doesn't have any money for him, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, is that we may see this story and think that's the norm for how prayer works. That the faith giants among us always get what they want when they pray. But I think that Luke has included this story because it's far outside of normal. And Peter certainly has not always been a giant of faith. Maybe the transformation happens in the knowledge that the miracle is not the norm. In fact, we can spend our whole lives praying for miracles that just don't happen. In contrast to my own times of silence, I know people in the Christ Lutheran congregation that are prayers to the point of being mystics. They have a special relationship with God. They amaze and inspire me. They are bold in praying for themselves, and they are even bolder in praying for others. But what I've noticed is that they never seem to be concerned about whether or not God will do what they ask. Maybe they have become the incredible people that I so admire, not despite the fact that all the miracles haven't happened, but maybe because they haven't. And still, they have been transformed through the consistent act of praying boldly. The miracles are the things that make the standout stories, but prayer is not a magic spell. And it is important to remember that there are things that prayer is not. There are ideas which over the centuries have crept into what I call extra biblical Christianity, ideas that aren't supported by the gospels. It's not a new thing at all. The apostle Paul railed against Christian groups that insisted that Christian converts had to be circumcised and follow kosher pur purity and food laws. Martin Luther fought vehemently against the extra-biblical traditions of purgatory and the idea that you could purchase a loved one's exit from there and into heaven. The idea that you could follow a formula and compel God. It's interesting to me how similar that medieval idea of purchasing indulgences is to the modern idea that you can give money to a church and then pray and believe strongly enough to compel God to do what you want, heal or make rich or change circumstances. The notion that if we pray right and have enough faith that God will comply and that somehow we have control over this, well, that's just not Christianity. It's paganism. That's the worship of Baals in the time of the Old Testament. That's any number of religions in which knowledge and technique are thought to be available to be used by humans to compel forces that are greater than ourselves. But this comes with considerable risk even in those religions. Get the technique wrong and there are consequences. And in stories, those gods that are compelled often have a last word that twists out of the intention of the compeller. Our God is good and loving, but not capricious and not compelable. We hate to be told no, and maybe we wish that there was a formula that would guarantee a yes, but we look out at real life and we know that there isn't. This is some risky truth, because we want reasons for what God will and will not do. If we have fervently prayed for God to rescue us from a traumatic situation, or prayed for the healing of ourselves or a loved one and it hasn't happened, well, it's natural to look for a reason. And the idea of God has a plan or God wanted another angel in heaven, well, those just aren't good enough. You didn't pray right would be painful, 
but at least it might be a reason. And it would be a lot easier for me to sit here and shrug my shoulders and say, that happened because you weren't a good enough Christian, than to truthfully say, I don't know why some prayers seem to be answered miraculously and some situations that are desperately prayed over by whole congregations of beautiful, faithful people turn from bad to worse. I don't know why God doesn't rescue the abused kid who offers up terrified prayers and hopes someone is listening. I don't know why one cancer disappears and why another is inoperable. And I confess that a lot of my own prayer life includes very heartfelt, angry expletives and what are you doing? Now more than ever, it is a given that the creator of the universe is participating in a larger arc of history than what we're even able to think about. But Jesus tells us that God is also interested in our lives, our needs, and our relationship through prayer. The God of the unthinkably vast cosmos also turns attention to the beating of our hearts and the respiration of our cells. Minutia matter to God. And our prayers for each end of this spectrum matter as well. St. Francis of Assisi prayed for birds and even for worms as he lovingly moved them out of pathways. We pray for the restoration of all creation whenever we pray, God, your kingdom come. The incarnation, Jesus becoming a human and walking around on earth, means that this Jesus is the best and most accurate representation of God we have. If we want to know what God is like, we look to Jesus. And part of the huge mystery of a God who is relationship is that Jesus was God, and Jesus talked to God. I want to shelve the possibility that we can't really wrap our brains around that for a moment, and instead look at both how he talked to God and how he responded. And this is because I think that the most important clues we have to bold prayer come from Jesus. When Jesus knows that he is going to be turned over to the authorities and experience the most pain, humiliation, and dehumanization possible, he prays. In Luke's gospel, he withdrew from the disciples about a stone's throw, knelt down, and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven, Luke writes, appeared to him and gave him strength. But he doesn't get up and decide that everything's fine because of this strength. No. Instead, in his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? He wakes them up and again tells them to pray. He knows what's going to happen. He knows it's going to be inexpressibly awful. He prays to be released from it, knowing that that cannot and will not be. This is the path of love that he has chosen, and he will see it through. Yet he prays with his heart so he can be with God in his anguish. Through this prayer, the human Jesus discovered that he could take the next steps. Unanswered prayer meant deep exploration of who he was. The miracles, they do happen, not often. But the real good news is that it is the act of bold prayer that's most important, not the results. Praying for God to do something big and abnormal changes us can make us people of bolder faith, whether the miracle happens or not. In prayer, we discover more and more who we are and how God is working in us. So my prayer for you this week, and I humbly ask that you will pray it for me as well, is that our prayers will become bolder, 
that we can ask for miracles without worrying about the result of our prayers, and that these bold prayers will help us on our journey into bolder faith. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. My name is Laura Duarte and I've been a member of Christ Lutheran for 49 years. Many of you already know that I'm a teacher and I teach fourth grade at Willow Glen here in Visalia. There's so many things I want to tell you about my role as a school teacher, but the most important thing about it is the Lord's purpose for me as an educator. You see, God led me to this profession after years of preparation as the oldest of five children, mother of three, parent helper in my kids' classrooms and various teaching roles at church. His further plan for me resulted in the completion of my degree, credential, and my first classroom teaching special ed kindergarten. He gave me a mission field in a public school system. Over the years, my classroom has become a sanctuary for me. It is a place where I feel the presence of God, especially when the children are there. It is my refuge, my safe place. It has been that way through the toughest seasons of my life. Even when the virus started, I felt a strange sense of safety inside my decades-old portable. My room is normal, friendly, and filled with life when my students are there. I would like to believe that my students feel the same way. Teaching is a challenging calling, especially with 30-plus children every year. The challenges come when you mix up lots of different children's behaviors, learning styles, and academic levels. There isn't anything easy about it, but it's more than rewarding and constantly 
I constantly see the Holy Spirit at work. He gives me ideas on the spot and I love to tell my coworkers about my Holy Spirit lessons. <laughs> School closure has been difficult for everyone involved, that's for sure. Instead of being with my kids every day at school, instruction and communication with them has been reduced to weekly phone calls, district work packets, and instructional help over the phone. We have not been able to have any face-to-face -face video contact with our students due to technology issues in a district with over 29,000 students. I'm thankful I get to talk to my students and their parents, but it's not the same, obviously. I feel so badly because they, like all of us, want to get back to normal. They ask me the what, where, when, why, and how questions, and I don't have the answers. It breaks my heart to tell them I don't know, and nobody knows. I tell them we just have to wait and see. What I want to tell them is that God knows exactly how and when all of this is going to play out and that we get to trust him and his faithfulness in all of it. But of course, I can't tell them that because of the nature of public schools, but I can pray for them and their families. God is here with us in the midst of all of it. He's sovereign, faithful, omniscient, and so much more. I am waiting with hope to see how his plans unfold, trusting him and trying really hard not to lean on my own understanding. When we acknowledge him in all that we do, he will make our path straight. He always does. Praise the Lord. We are invited by God to pray with boldness, joy, and confidence, knowing that our prayers will be heard by a loving and gracious God. Please join me as we pray for ourselves, our community, and our world. God in heaven, we thank you for communities of faith that strive to extend welcome by whatever means necessary so that the stories of your son Jesus can continue to echo beyond the walls of church sanctuaries. We are grateful for the technological tools that we are able to utilize in order to keep us connected to each other during this time. We pray for the individuals who are dedicated to creating a new normal as we continue to venture forth into a world unlike any we've known, bringing along as much familiarity as they are able. God of healing, we lift up those who are sick, the poor in spirit, and those who are experiencing pain of mind, body, and soul. We ask for wholeness, comfort, and peace for all those who await your healing touch. Lord, we recognize that we may have people in our lives who do not know your unconditional grace and love. We pray that all will find peace in your redemptive embrace. As we continue to hear sermons about those with bold faith who have come before us, let us live our lives boldly. This is certainly a time for bold faith and bold prayer. We boldly pray for the safety of doctors, nurses, and frontline workers who are actively fighting COVID-19. We boldly pray for the scientists who are seeking treatments and vaccines. We boldly pray for the families who have lost loved ones. We boldly pray for an end to this pandemic. And most of all, we boldly pray that through it all, we can remember that our God is a God of love. And so it is with boldness that we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I know it's not easy, but here at Christ Lutheran Church, we continue to stay connected and do our very best to connect one another. And so I want to remind you of a couple of places and ways for you to be a part of conversations and togetherness in the ministry that we share. All things new. That describes our devotional focus and our small group gathering focus for right now. Now, I hope that you're, you're staying current with the daily devotional guide that was mailed to our memberships. If you didn't receive one, please contact the church office. We'll drop one in the mail to you, and it doesn't matter whether or not you are a member. 
and make sure that you connect on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for a Zoom meeting conversation about all things new. The Zoom connection is found in the weekly e-blast, or again, you can call the church office to get that contact information. And here's the reality. In these days of COVID-19, all things are new. How do we find the work of God in these challenging times? Make sure you stay engaged to discover answers to that question. And then I'd love for you to join me for a weekly Bible study entitled Theology on Tap. Every Thursday at 5.30, we get together on Zoom and we read and study the Gospel of Mark. It doesn't matter your background, how much you know of the Bible, whether or not this is a first time for you, we'd love for you to join us. You need to check the weekly e-blast for the Zoom connection information, or again, contact the church office to get that information. And then finally, we wanna stay connected to you in every means possible, and one wonderful way is through your phone, your smartphone. So what we're asking you to do is to be a part of our contact information with our brand new 41411 connection. Now, here's how you do it. You take your smartphone, right? You find the section that allows you to provide messages, so your new message section. And then in the block that says two, you simply add 41411. Looks like that. And then in the subject section, you simply type in C-L-C-V-I-S-A-L-I-A, C-L-C Visalia. It looks like that. You hit the green button and you're connected. That's all you have to do. We'd love for you to stay connected in this important way because that way we can send you information about upcoming events or important information and news about the membership and the life of your church. Many things are taking place. I invite you to be a part of the ministry that we share together.
And now, receive the benediction. May God's peace be upon you. For every thing that creeps into your mind, have peace. For every challenge that lays ahead of you, have peace. For every struggle that exists within you, have peace. For every decision that comes your way, have peace. Know that the Prince of Peace, the risen Christ, our Savior, is with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.